I was thinking today when I was studying for this message on hearing from God and the things, kinds of things that God says, I uh, was thinking about a time when I went to Africa on a mission trip, and I was there for about six weeks and uh, learned quite a bit about some of the culture and some of the dangers, and not only was it politically a little bit sketchy from time to time, government was kind of in a, a situation of unrest. There were animals out there that they had to prepare you for, and that's the thing I think I was the least prepared for. So before I took a trip out into one of the plains outside uh, in Kenya, outside of Nairobi, uh, there was a guy who said um, to me, you're going to be in snake country, and so you need to be prepared. And I said, great, I'm just going to stay away from them. And he said, well, no, sometimes you can't stay away from them. He said, we need to teach you how to kill cobras before you go out into this area because there's a chance that you'll encounter one. Now, I wasn't particularly interested in learning how to kill a cobra, but he suggested if I didn't know that it may kill me. And so I was listening. He said, it's really simple. He said, when a cobra comes at you, that's the first thing he said. Now, that's disheartening when he said, when a cobra comes at you, because I wasn't going to go at a cobra, but if a cobra comes at me, uh, then what do you do? Well, you have your stick. And I'm thinking, what stick? And he goes, well, everybody has a stick. They have a small stick and they have a big stick. You take your small stick and you throw it at the cobra. So what happens? He goes, well, then the cobra lunges at the small stick. And I said, okay, then what do you do? He goes, you take your big stick and you whack it till it's dead. I didn't have a stick. And I'm like, well, that makes a lot of sense to me. But I asked him, I said, where do I get a stick? And he looked at me and said, everybody has a stick. Now, this was a Maasai, and Maasai are shepherds, and for a shepherd, everybody has a stick. It was just natural. They picked their stick at their right of manhood, their passage into adulthood as they became uh, moving from little kids into to being shepherds and taking on their job they were going to have the rest of their life. They went out into the brush. They found the perfect stick for them that matched their height, that matched their strength. They were going to make it part of their lives, learn how to use it. It was a symbol of what they did for a living, of the money that they were going to earn. It was a symbol of the influence that they were going to have by moving sheep from one place to another. And I'm going to talk to you today about the significance of a stick, of a staff. It's Moses' staff. And how Moses' staff transitioned from Moses' staff to what was after this incident called the rod of God because Moses learned to throw down his staff. Now, this message is super simple. It's one you may have heard before in some other shape or form. The outline is not new. It's uh, like Texas Hold'em or golf. It takes a moment to learn, but a lifetime to master. It's one of these concepts that we all nod our head and agree, yeah, 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 this is probably true, but to really do it unlocks the secret of being a disciple of Christ, the life of faith. So we're going to read this story together, and I'm going to assume many of you know the story of Moses. If you're new to church, you probably have still seen some movies or read a book on Moses. Maybe you've heard the story, and you kind of know, you know, just sort of the outline or the gist. So I'm not going to be too terribly detailed, but just as a matter of background, we pick up in Moses' life here um, after he had been miraculously saved by God uh, and delivered into Pharaoh's home instead of being murdered, was raised to be the next leader in Egypt, and uh, made a rash decision that may have had the right intention but the wrong application, and he committed a murder. And because of that, he was a refugee from Egypt and took off out into the desert. And the Bible says, and I love this part of Scripture, it's found uh, in the beginning part of Exodus, that Moses ran and he ran and he ran and he ran and he ran. And then he sat down, which is the best thing to do when you're running. Some of you may find yourself uh, in a situation where you're running from God. Maybe you don't want to hear what he has to say. Maybe you're afraid of what he's going to say. Maybe you think he doesn't care enough to speak to you. So I want to encourage you today, if you're running, that you do exactly what Moses did and that you sit down. Because he loves you. Jesus cares about you. And God wants to speak to us far more than we are willing to listen to him. So he sat down, and when he finally sat down, he heard from God what was next, but he heard through a person. And this is how God speaks so many times, through people and through circumstances. He met a man who had a daughter, and he married the daughter and went to work for the man and became a shepherd. And for 40 years, this person who was going to be the next leader of Egypt became a Bedouin um, sheep herder on literally, the Bible says, the backside of nowhere. And then one day, after 40 years of learning to be content in his circumstances, 
learning his new identity, getting used to this limited income, having very little influence, he heard a voice from God. But the voice didn't just come like any voice you may expect. It came from a bush that was burning and would not burn up. Now, I think the, the Hollywood renditions of this bush maybe are a little bit overstated, where it looks like this huge, lush tree, and you know that it's something that you would want to drop down and worship. The Bible communicates this as just an ordinary bush. But it was an extraordinary circumstance. And the voice of the Lord came to Moses and, and said, called out to Moses and said, you know, come closer. And Moses came a little closer, and he said, okay, that's enough. Take off your shoes. Don't come any closer. And God began to speak to him. And he began to unfold his plan for him. And that's what Moses desperately needed was to hear from God. It's what you and I desperately need to hear from God. But as God unfolded his plan for Moses, Moses got overwhelmed because all he heard was, Moses, you're going to have to do this. Moses, you're going to have to accomplish this. Moses, you're going to have to step out of your comfort zone. But what God was really telling him is, is Moses, I'm going to do all these things. All you need to do is put yourself in the right place at the right time and obey me and watch the things that I'm going to do through you. And so Moses had a little argument with God. And here in Exodus chapter 4, he was asking a question you and I ask. It's the biggest enemy of our faith. It is the, really, the beginning of fear. And it's the question of what if. Well, what if, God, what you say isn't really true? What if I risk all this and, and it doesn't really happen? What if I step out and I fail? What if? I live with the question of what if. You live with the question of what if. And it's a question that we have to learn to be comfortably uncomfortable with. Because when we follow God, there's always the question of what if. But see, it doesn't have to, to paralyze us or to terrify us. Because we serve a God who controls all of the billions of contingencies in life to bring about His perfect plan. He has all of the information available to Him. He knows everything and doesn't need to wait to learn or to see what's going to happen. And so even though for us it looks like a what if, God says, trust me, believe me, don't just believe in me. Do you want this life of faith? So that's my question to you right off the bat. Do you want to live the life of faith, the real life of faith? A life of a disciple of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at that, and I'm going to talk to you today about things God says. Now, I hope this last week you uh, paid some attention the seven days prior to today, last Sunday, when I suggested that you get alone, that you meet with God, that maybe you listen to the Lord with the Bible in your lap, that you possibly write down some things that you might have heard from God and reflect on these things. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But I did this this last week, and I really heard from the Lord. I got a verse. And uh, to say I got a verse, I mean, that sounds a little trite, but this was something that God showed me. And I want to just read it to you as motivation for you maybe uh, to really apply this to your life. This is found in Psalm 32, begins in verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Here it is in verse 9. This was the one that's for me. Do not be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding, but must be controlled by a bit and a bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. That was a great verse, a great encouragement. And to me, it reminded me that I don't want to be like the mule or the horse that has to be pulled to the Lord to listen but that we want to hear the voice of God and we want to respond. So let's look today at the kinds of things that God says. As a matter of fact, these are things that God says over and over through Scripture. Once again, a super simple outline. You're going to learn it just like this. may have heard it before, but it takes a lifetime to really get it right. Exodus chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, Moses answered God and says, What if? What if they don't believe me or listen to me? And they said, the Lord didn't appear to you. And then the Lord said to him, what is it that's in your hand? What is that in your hand? Now, when God asks a question, does he know the answer to the question? This happened last service too. Yeah. I'm like, okay, let me try it again. When God asks a question, do you think God knows the answer to the question ahead of time? Yes. So why would God ask the question? To get us to answer it. And he asks a question. He said, what's in your hand? So I'm going to ask you this question today. What's in your hand? 
Now, I want to define this for you. I want to help you think this through. But I'm going to ask you that whatever it is in your hand, that you do exactly what Moses did, which is to throw it down. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it down. Moses threw it on the ground, and what? It became a snake. Now, this, this is a, a beautiful double meaning in Scripture. And this is in your notes, by the way, if you have your app and you've downloaded your PDF, all these notes are in there. But the symbol of Egypt, and God was sending Moses back to Egypt to deliver ultimately the children of Israel from their bondage. The symbol of power, of deity, of worship, um, the cultural symbol in Egypt was that of a cobra. The Pharaoh wore that on his headpiece, that of a cobra. And so there was a big corporate promise meaning here, significance. It was symbolic that when Moses threw down his staff, it became a serpent. Because then, after he threw it down and it came alive, well, Moses did what you and I would have done, ran from it, right? And the Lord said, reach out your hand and snatch it up by the tail. Anybody who knows snakes, and I don't, except as I mentioned before, stay away from them. And if you don't, you better have a stick, right? Um, God said, grab it by the tail. Now, this time Moses is like, all right, God, no more arguing. Reached down and grabbed it. But what if? Uh, not even cross his mind, right? Grabbed it by the tail. As soon as he did, it became a staff. Wow, significant. So Moses reached out, took hold of it, it turned back into a staff. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Throw it down. What did the staff represent to Moses? It represented three things to Moses. It represented three very important things. It represented what was in his hand. First of all, it was his identity. Moses' identity was wrapped up in this staff. The staff was a symbol of what he did for a living. The staff was something that shepherds would carry. And if you saw somebody with a staff in their hands, you knew right away what they did. And it's important for us to consider that when we become believers in Jesus Christ, that we give our identity to Him, that you become a new person. And this is where you may have been lied to. And I don't think it was on purpose. I think it just happened, and I'm not exactly sure why. But somehow in Christianity, we cheapened the meaning of what it meant to be a follower of Jesus Christ to the point where people were deceived into thinking that all it was was just saying a prayer, signing a card, and adding Jesus to their life. You'll be blessed in all you do. You'll feel good when you feel bad. If you ever run into trouble, you got the big guy upstairs to bail you out. And there were years and years and years that there were movements in our churches where all they told you was if you would just pray this prayer and sign this card and add Jesus to your life, that everything's going to be fine. You got to get out of hell free card in your pocket. And if you ever get into a jam, you got somebody up there that's looking out for you. And the Bible says that when you become a believer in Jesus, that your identity has changed, that you're a new person. Paul, the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the absolutely true, uh, the Holy Spirit through the absolutely true Word of God says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I don't live anymore, but Jesus lives in me. That's a huge statement. But when a person becomes a believer, in a sense, a very real spiritual sense, we're dead. And the identity that we take on is Christ who lives within us. The life I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Our identity. What do we base our identities in? What we do for a living, where we live, what we drive, who we know, the degrees we have, the clothes we wear, the family we come from. And Jesus said, when you choose to follow me, throw it down. It's really, really hard. Really hard. But you become a new person. Now, what if? It's a question that comes to mind. I don't know who I'll be if I give you everything I am. And God says, believe me. Don't just believe in me. It's the life of faith. Filled with what ifs. But the what-ifs are making, that, that's what makes it real. 
So let's move on very quickly. Again, it's very simple. The staff represents influence. Now, what influence did Moses have left? Now, back when he was the prince of Egypt, he would have had a, sto- a, a stick that would have represented, probably made out of bronze or had a bronze tip on it that would have represented his power. But as a shepherd, he simply moved sheep from one place to the other, but he moved these the sheep from one place to the other, looked out for them, and influenced them toward what would bless them ultimately, which is for a sheep, a good meal and some fresh water. But you and I have influence, and it's one of the things that we're oftentimes most reluctant to give to the Lord. We have relationships, we have networks, but beyond that, we have words and we have actions. And influence is very, very simple. We talked about this in our last series last fall, and I just cut and pasted some of those notes because I really like what I shared with you then. I'm going to share it with you again. Influence is the capacity to have an effect on somebody, their character, their development, their behavior. Uh, it, it's either the effect or the, uh, the capacity to affect or the effect itself. And the things I say influence the people who are around me, but oftentimes I don't give those to the Lord. People either build down, uh, up or tear down with their words, and some of us tear down with our words. The things that I choose to say, I have to offer to the Lord. When my wife woke up this morning, she said, good morning to me. And you know what I did back to her? I grunted at her. That's how I was feeling this morning. I was one of those days, I mean, some days it's just like that. But I grunted, and I just went, ugh, like that. And um, Joy, smart enough to read my, you know, my grunt, she didn't press it any further, but she was in a good mood. She was happy. What did I do? Right off the bat, we open our eyes. I grunt at my wife. I influenced her morning. Now, is that a minor thing? Of course. We just celebrated 30 years of marriage. Is she going to forgive me? Yeah. We've been through a whole lot worse than that. But even something as simple as an unfortunate grunt can change somebody's day. Think of the rest of the words you might have said this morning, and to whom? The words that come out of our mouth reflect the attitudes of our heart. And influence is about building up, not tearing down. Sometimes it's the words we choose to say, and sometimes it's the omission of words we should say. Because encouragement is something so close to the heart of Jesus that he did it over and over and over again. Make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Do you hear that? If you did a word audit, and I'm speaking to myself, trust me, not just you. A word audit. The words that come out of my mouth reflects the condition of my heart. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings out evil things of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they've spoken. Holy moly, that's a list for me. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words, you will be condemned. Well, influence doesn't just have to do with what we choose to say. It has to do with what we choose to do. And we, sometimes as Christians, are the worst because we have all the right words. And we say all the right kinds of things. And we call Jesus Lord. And we call one another brother. But we live in a way that's so disconnected from that. We fool ourselves not the people who are around us, and the world around us when they watch don't see Jesus anywhere near it. What we do and what we say influences, nudges people either further toward a relationship with Jesus or further away, and we're responsible. So influence is something that this staff represented, and the third thing that this staff represented, and this is important, is it represented his income. And I've been thinking a lot about this during December particularly, and we've been on a a little initiative as a church to be um, responsible to give more faithfully, to make sure that we commit more and more of our resources to the Lord. And I've been asking myself the question, why? 
Why is this so important? I know all the answers, and I've been to seminary, and I've studied my Bible, and I've heard messages just like you have. But I want to talk to you about this for just a second, because this really, I think, at its most fundamental level, is the reason that we have to throw down our income, as well as our influence, as well as our identity, and give it to the Lord. Because when you throw it down, what happens? It comes to life. And when you pick it back up again, it turns right back into a stick. It's because we don't work for ourselves. And this is a difficult thought for us, particularly as Americans, because we're all about building our own fortune, building our own kingdom. I'm working hard. I got what's mine. If I'm nice, I'll share a little bit of it with you. But that's not a New Testament concept. The New Testament concept is that when we become followers of Jesus Christ, that we enter into a voluntary servanthood called a bond servant relationship where everything we have doesn't belong to us anymore. It literally belongs to the master. Now, the reason this was a concept culturally that was popular back then, in Roman law, it said that, or Roman times, it was said that two-thirds of the people, of the citizens at one point, were either slaves or bond servants, and had either worked their way back out, or when they had worked their way out, could choose to go back in, and they had to make a decision. And the decision was, is my life going to be better if I live for the master? Or is my life going to be better if I live on my own and live for me? And they had to make a choice. And if they said, I trust my master, I trust this person to take care of me, I know he's going to treat me far better than I would ever be able to treat myself. I know that my future is secure. I'm going to serve this person. They would have a ceremony. And during this ceremony, they would go to the gate of the city and they would have their ear pierced with an awl. And it was, it was symbolic, but it was significant. And it meant, I now work for you. And everything they had did not belong to them. It belonged to the master. And as they worked for the master and gave everything to him, the master was generous and loving and gave everything they needed back to them. But along with this identity, well, comes this attitude, and it's the attitude of a servant. I don't give a little of what I have. Everything I have goes to the master who I serve. And he gives some back to me because he loves me. That's the attitude of a New Testament Christian. It's the attitude of a life of faith. But it's really hard when we put it into practice. So we see Moses here as God says, what's in your hand? For Moses, it was his identity. It was his influence. It was his income. God said, throw it down. And when he did, he brought it to life. But the second he picked it back up again, just a stick. Interesting to note that before this story, it was called Moses' staff. After this story, it was called the rod of God. But the question, what's in your hand? Certainly a relevant question. For me, I decided to ask myself this question. All right, Rick. You're going to ask the church people this on Sunday. You're going to ask them to take whatever's in their hand and to throw it down. Are you going to do that too? And from time to time in my life, I've had to sort of check myself and make sure that, that I'm you know, living consistent to this principle. And it's really, really hard, even for me. And for me as a pastor, it's a privilege for me to be your pastor. I love what I do. I love my job. But for me, I thought, what's in my hand? What's the symbol of, it's, it's this Bible right here, right? It is my identity, been a pastor for 30 years. Began working in churches in 1989. All I've done, it's really all I think I can do. I'm not even sure if I'm good at it, but I know I wouldn't be good at anything else. But it's my identity. I never even considered doing anything else. It is my influence. It's all wrapped up in, in this. My income. I don't do it for the money, certainly, but I mean, it's, you know, how we pay the bills. And this last week, as I'm studying and preparing for this message, God asked me, are you willing to lay it down? Are you willing to give it to me? And there's been one other specific time in my 30 years where I feel like God's asked me that. And this was really interesting. It was hard for me. I'm thinking it through. I'm praying about it, going, God, oh, what if? Absolutely, Lord, it's yours. It's not mine. You gave it to me in the first place. It belongs to you. This is yours, not mine. Lay it down. 
As much as it seems difficult for you to believe it would be hard for me to do that, it was an exercise in faith. What's in your hand? These are the things that God says. First, I won't use anything you have until you let go of it. Not yours. Nothing. Um, what is it you're not letting go of? I can't answer these questions for you. Wish I could. Um, for some, well, I guess the first thing you think about, whatever pops to mind, it's probably pretty present, probably pretty current, relevant in your thinking right now. Some of the things that are hard for us to let go of. Habits. Thoughts. Children. Possessions. Friendships. What are the things that are in your hand? Are you willing to let them go? What if God takes them from me? Fair question. What if God takes them from me? Do you believe God or do you simply believe in God? What kind of God do you serve? If he decided to take them from you, what would be his motive? What would be his purpose? To bless you, not to hurt you. To guarantee your future, to free you. But it's so hard to let go. Number two, God says, I won't ask you to give me something that you don't already have. He's created you with spiritual gifts, with a heart, with abilities, with certain personalities, both good and bad with experiences in your life. And he's not going to ask you to give him anything that you don't already possess. Number three, you're never going to know your full potential until you allow God to have full control of your life. But what if? What if I give God everything? It's scary. And in my own life, I visualize it like this. I walk up to the edge of a faith cliff and I don't know what's on the other side, but I know God's asking me to step off. And I've asked the question time and time and time again, what if you don't catch me this time, God? And you know, every single time I've had to step off. And do you know that every single time he's caught me? And the decision to step off has been the decision that's led me toward the plan that he has for me in the first place. You're never going to know your full potential until you allow God to have full control. Now remember, this is just a reminder, number four, that he whispers in the wind, that he shouts in the silence, and that we have to get very good at hearing from him. We're going to talk more about that next week. And finally, number five, his plan for you is far greater than the dream that you ever have for yourself. Are you listening? Are you listening? Do you want to hear? Are you afraid to hear? Are you leaning in? Are you leaning out? We're going to spend all of 2020 together talking about these kinds of things. Starting in February, looking at the life of Abraham, a man that learned to hear the voice of God to live with the fear of the question, what if? To succeed, to fail, but ultimately to be obedient and change the world forever. We're going to look at it through his eyes, but also apply it to our life as you see yourself becoming more and more each day the person who Jesus intended in the first place. Pray with me, please. Father, I thank you for my friends.